Hey guys, this is Craig Migliaccio with AC Service Tech, and today what we're going over is saturated refrigerant temperatures, pressures, and the PT chart. So we're going to be going over the basics of how to read a refrigerant gauge and some of those basic things that we need to do and know before checking the refrigerant charge of an air conditioning system. Make sure to check out our Refrigerant Charging and Service Procedures for Air Conditioning book. This book is available over at Amazon.com and also at our website at acservicetech.com. This book includes all the basics that you would need in order to work with refrigerants, refrigerant charging methods step-by-step, -step, and all the tools used in each of the procedures. So once again, you can check out more information at our website at acservicetech.com. When I teach about refrigerants, I start with the saturated temperatures of the refrigerants. A saturated refrigerant is a refrigerant that has both liquid and vapor existing at the same time in the same place. So a good example of that is in a refrigerant bottle. So whether that's a new virgin refrigerant bottle or that's a recovery bottle, if a refrigerant bottle is full or if it's close to empty, as long as it has some liquid refrigerant in that bottle, it's going to maintain the same pressure at a certain temperature. So let's use the example of 75 degrees. So if the room is 75 degrees and the bottle is at 75 degrees, you can see right here in this picture, we have a temp meter on the bottle, tape right on the side, and it's reading 75 degrees Fahrenheit. On a Virgin R22 bottle, we know that at 75 degrees, our pressure on that bottle should be 132 PSI if we measured it at the port. For an R410A refrigerant bottle at 75 degrees, we know the pressure should be 217 PSI. And the reason we know that is by using a pressure temperature chart. This PT chart is courtesy of National Refrigerant Sync, and you can check out this PT chart over at their website at refrigerants.com. On a pressure temperature chart, we have either temperatures on the left-hand side or pressures on the left-hand side. On this PT chart, you see that there's temperatures on the left-hand side, and they go down in increments of 5 degrees Fahrenheit. And over at the top on the right, you see that you have the different refrigerants. So we're not going to get into the bubble and do blended refrigerants. We're going to be just going over R22, which is a single component refrigerant, and R410A, which is a what's called a near azeotropic refrigerant. So R410A is made up of two refrigerants, and they are R32 and R125. But both of those two refrigerants that make up R410A are very, very close. They're only 0.3 degrees off from each other. So we, we were able to use a standard PT chart in order to determine the pressure at certain temperatures. So here's an example of a pressure temperature chart. And you see that if we were to move down to 90 degrees for R22, say that refrigerant bottle was at 90 degrees, then the pressure would end up rising up to 168 PSI. So if the R410A bottle was at 90 degrees, we would know that the pressure inside the bottle was 274 PSI. So if we know the temperature of a refrigerant, then therefore we know the pressure that the refrigerant should be at, as long as the refrigerant is not mixed with air or nitrogen or another refrigerant. This is also how we know to distinguish between refrigerants in a recovery bottle. So on a recovery bottle, if we don't know what refrigerants inside the recovery bottle, we can keep that recovery bottle at a stable temperature. And so we take our temperature reading. And in the case of 75 degrees, if we read 217 PSI on the gauge, then we know that we have a recovery bottle with R410A inside. If we had a recovery bottle at 75 degrees and it read 132 PSI, then we would know that the recovery bottle has R22. But say the recovery bottle, we had it labeled for R410A and we kept it at a stable temperature at 75 degrees, and it measured 240 PSI, we would know that we have something else mixed in that bottle besides the refrigerant. And if that were the case, it's likely that maybe air got pulled into that recovery bottle during a recovery process accidentally. So in the case of 245 PSI, we know that that recovery bottle has air, nitrogen, or is mixed with another refrigerant. So we, we wanna be careful with that recovery bottle and we wanna go ahead and exchange that recovery bottle. And you may have to pay extra in order to exchange that bottle because it doesn't have just that one refrigerant inside of it. Now, if we look on the face of a compound gauge, you see that we have a PT chart overlaid on top of the gauge set. And on these gauges right here, we have R22, R410A, and R404A. So depending on the refrigerant manifold gauge set that you would need, you would buy one with the appropriate saturated temperatures that you would need. So if you were working on R134A systems, then you would want to get gauges that have the PT chart for 
R134A on them. So if you're working on air conditioning systems, it would be good to have a gauge that has a saturated temperatures of R22 and R410A on the gauge face. Pressure is measured on the outer ring and you bring that into the saturated temperature. So the green ones in this example are R22 saturated temperature and R410A is the black one. On these gauge faces, these PSI increments are measured in five PSI G increments. So PSI G means that it's pressure per square inch gauge. So that's, if you hear PSI G, that's what it means. It just means the gauge pressure. So you could talk in PSI or PSI G. At 168 PSI G on the outer ring, if you were to bring that into the saturated temperature of R22, which is the green inner ring, you're going to see that that needle lines up at 90 degrees Fahrenheit. If we were to take that 168 PSI and you continue to bring it into the R4 to 9 saturated temperature, you're going to see it aligned to 59 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's important to know how to read the compound manifold gauge set. And you see that on the low side gauge, which would be the blue gauge, it only goes up to a lower pressure. And you see on the red gauge, it goes up to a higher pressure. So the blue is the low side gauge and the red is the high side gauge. And you may have them both at high pressure if you had a heat pump manifold gauge set. But it is very important to know how to read those saturated temperatures on those gauges. And we're always just reading pressure in order to convert it to saturated temperature. So you could use the, the gauge face to convert the pressure to saturated temperature. You could use a PT chart. You could use a PT app. Or you could use a digital manifold set. And the PT charts would be built into the display. If you walk up to a system that has the high side and the low side pressures equalized, so they're both at the same pressure and the, the system is at a steady temperature, then you're going to know what pressure should be in that system. So say the rating plate is worn off and you're not sure what refrigerant's in that system and you don't have a refrigerant analyzer, then what you would do is you would hook up your gauges, read your pressure, take your outdoor temperature, and you would compare that to the saturated temperature to see if they align. So in this instance, the outdoor temperature is 75 degrees, the indoor temperature is 75 degrees, and the pressure on the outdoor condenser is reading 217 PSI. So you know that this system is R410A. On the outdoor unit rating plate, you're going to see the refrigerant that's supposed to be in that system, or at least what was shipped from the factory. And also on the compressor, usually there's another tag that would say the refrigerant in that system, but say those tags were worn off or they were missing, at least you would know what refrigerants in that system based on the pressures and temperatures while the refrigerants in the saturated state. So now we know that this system is R410A and while the system is running, you're going to have the saturated state occurring not across the whole system, but only in the evaporator and also in the condenser. So we're going to be able to measure the saturated temperature in the middle of the condenser using the red high side gauge. So we're going to convert that pressure to temperature and in this case, we're reading 317 PSI, and it converts to a saturated temperature of 100 degrees. So when that refrigerant is changing from a vapor into a liquid in the middle of that condenser coil, it's at 100 degrees. And the pressure read on the low side gauge in the large vapor line, we read 118 PSI. So if we convert that to saturated temperature, it reads 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So we know that that indoor evaporator coil is very close to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we're reading that vapor pressure all the way out at the outdoor unit. So it could fluctuate a little bit with what that pressure actually is at the indoor evaporator quill. But typically there's not a port there, so we have to measure it out at the outdoor condensing unit. So in this case, the saturated temperature is roughly 40 degrees at that indoor evaporator quill. These saturated temperatures tell us a lot and we're able to measure superheat and subcooling in order to measure the refrigerant charge based upon those saturated temperatures that we're reading on the gauge set. If we were to measure the temperature on the large vapor line within three inches of that vapor port, which is the low pressure port, then we're gonna be able to read what the total superheat of the system is. So say we read 52 degrees on the large vapor line and we have a saturated temperature of 40 degrees, then that means that 52 minus 40, so we have 12 degrees of total superheat. Also on the high side gauge, if we were to read the temperature on the small liquid line within three inches of the liquid port, and in this case we read 90 degrees, then you take 100 degrees as a saturated temperature minus the actual temperature, and we read 10 degrees of subcooling. So subcooling is the temperature decrease of the liquid refrigerant 
right after where it turns from a saturated state into a liquid until where it comes out of the service port at the outdoor unit. Total superheat is the temperature increase of the vapor refrigerant right after the saturated state in the evaporator coil where it turns into a complete vapor. So from there until where the vapor enters into that service port over at the outdoor unit. If you want to learn more about checking the refrigerant charge with total superheat and with subcooling, check out our paperback and also our ebook, which are available at our website at acservicetech.com and also our paperback over at amazon.com. We also have videos linked in the description section below. Hope you enjoyed yourself and we'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.